Our next speaker is Prof. Klaus von Klesing, who will speak on the quantum revolution in metrology. The Q&A session will be moderated by Prof. Alexander Ling from the National University of Singapore. Prof, please. Yes, welcome to another revolution in science. And today I will speak about the revolution in metrology, the quantum revolution. And fortunately, it has some connection to my Nobel Prize discovery of the quantum Hall effect. And I will tell you a little bit the story of an unexpected discovery 44 years ago, which recently revolutionized our international system of units. And I think everyone should be familiar with our basic units, with the SI units that all measurements, all measurements in our universe can be traced back to the seven base units of our SI system, the meter, kilogram, second, ampere, Kelvin, mole, candela. Everything in biology, in chemistry, in physics can be traced back to these base units, and they have to be very reliable base units. And we have now new definitions for four of these base units since May 20, 2019, and I will tell you a little more about these new base units. And there's even a stamp in Korea which shows you the seven base units. And then here are the new units, the new kilogram, the new ampere, the new Kelvin, the new mole. And on May 20th, 2019, all governments in the world had to change the laws for the units. Because for international trade, you need reliable units. So on this day, we had this big revolution in metrology, in the science of measurements. And an analysis said that about 2 billion people worldwide heard something about this revolution. Perhaps they didn't understand the details, but this means 25% of the world population heard something about it. So everyone here should know everything already. But I hope I can tell you also something which you don't know. No, even the New York Times made the coverage about this important meeting, the 26th meeting of the International Committee of Weights and Measure in 2018. And the title was, Representatives of the Meter Convention voted anonymously to redefine four basic units of measurement, the kilogram, the mole, the Kelvin, and the ampere. And among them was Klaus von Klitzing, front row, taking a picture. And I found myself there, yes, <laughs> taking a picture. And normally, I don't take pictures at uh, conferences. But it, it was really a very special conference. There were standing ovations about this decision of this committee. Perhaps I should take a picture here. It's a much better, nicer picture here of this meeting. <laughs> because if you look at the people, they are much older than you. <laughs> OK, let's have a picture. Smile, please. OK, wonderful. Now I have a memory of this wonderful meeting here. Because this was really uh, an historical event. So uh, I will show you here the people which voted. And even Hungary or Turkey, they are famous in Europe that they vote against something because they want to have more money. But also the United States, China, Russia, all of the countries voted yes. And I think this is really an historical event. This will not happen in the near future again, that everyone agrees on something. You see, the power of science is helpful to have some agreement. And quantum metrology united all countries in this way. And there are books, both in Chinese or in English here, a book about the new international system of units, quantum metrology, quantum standards. And the main topics are related to atomic clocks, the Joseph effect, the quantum Hall effect, single electron pump. These are the topics in this field of quantum metrology. And since I discovered the quantum Hall effect, I introduced this additional quantum for the Hall effect. I will concentrate on this quantum Hall effect. And this is the contrast Hall effect you see here. You have to learn a little bit Swedish to understand this. This was the quantitative Hall effect discovered 1980. Five years later, already, the Nobel Prize. And there was a big impact of this phenomenon. And I have here a picture of the discovery of the quantum Hall of Nobel 
on the 5th of February, I know exactly the time, at 2 o'clock in the morning, doing an experiment. And this is a famous picture. Uh, no, this was taken later because the journalists wanted to have a picture finally. And, but this is the truth. You see, it must be Grenoble. Like everywhere in the world, alcohol is forbidden, also here at the campus. We learned this yesterday. Uh, but red wine in France is like water, so it's still allowed. <laughs> and you have a baguette and the cheese. Now, this has a big impact. You see here in 1980, here are the papers per year. We have now 17,000 papers where this name, Quantum Hall Effect, is in the title or in the abstract. And the first step, Plateau here, was a Nobel Prize uh, for the Quantum Hall Effect. But there are many other Nobel Prizes. The fractional Quantum Hall Effect, some years later, and also the Graphene and the Nobel Prize for Novozilo from Geheim. Then the topology is a very important aspect. And fortunately, we have here two of these Nobel Prize winners, Novozilo and Haldane, uh, at this meeting. And tonight, we will hear also another talk by Professor Haldane uh, related to topology. Now, I will concentrate only on this small peak here in the publications, the quantum Hall effect and metrology, and the main application of the quantum Hall effect in this small field is a new type of electric resistor. And this was a discovery, the unexpected discovery. And the final result, I will not speak about the details of quantum physics. This is a new type of quantum resistor. If you have a graphene, this is a single layer, one atomic uh, layer thick uh, carbon. If you put a current through this, and if you apply a magnetic field, then you can measure the perpendicular to the current flow, this voltage. And just this ratio of the measured voltage divided by the measured current, these macroscopic quantities, then you find a resistor which has the value h of e squared. h is the Planck constant, e is elementary charge. Today, this is called the von Klitzing constant. So these fundamental constants, Planck constant divided by e squared, this is the value, and this is 25,812.807457304 ohms. And you can do this everywhere in the world. Our students have to do this in the practical course. And here is one of the experiments of the uh, quantum Hall effect. So the classical line is this line here, is the magnetic field. And normally, these, this Hall voltage increases linearly with the magnetic field. But in the quantum Hall effect, you have here these wonderful plateaus, independent of the magnetic field. You have the constant value here, Hall plateau, here in the positive magnetic field or here in the negative magnetic field. And everywhere in the world, you can use different so-called two-dimensional system where the electrons flow in the plane. And these are the experimental facts. There was a test of universality of the quantized Hall effect. Originally, I discovered this in silicon field effect transistors, which is the most important device in microelectronics against the gallium arsenide heterostructures. And already in 1991, they tested that you have the same results for these two different uh, devices. And this has been tested for many, many different devices, gallium arsenide, silicon, graphene, so-called the fractional quantum Hall effect, the so-called quantum anomalous Hall effect, all these different phenomena. And all of them, finally, show no significant differences at the level of one part to 10 to 10. So this really fantastic, stable, electrical resistor, which depends only on fundamental constant. Like the velocity of light is everywhere the same, and you have different velocities in other uh, phenomena. So the result is the quantum Hall effect allows a simple and direct access to a precise value of the fundamental constant, Planck constant divided by elementary charge square. And these fundamental constants are, to our knowledge, stable in time and space, and therefore, this idea that fundamental constant should be the ideal basis of our international system of units, because they are stable, they are reliable. So this is a basic idea. And we have not only this quantum ohm, this value h of e squared, which is von Klitzing constant more stable than any wire resistor. We have also another phenomenon in electricity, the quantum volt. I, once again, I will not discuss the physics behind this, the Josephson effect. This is a theoretician. He predicted already as a student there must be effect if you have superconductors and you radiate this from microwave. You have a voltage, a voltage once more, which depends only on the Planck constant and the elementary charge 
and the frequency, which is very well known, uh, for example, with atomic clocks, you can calibrate the frequency. So we have two quantum phenomena which are very, very stable, and very, very reliable. And today, these quantum units are today integrated in our new international system of units. And I will discuss this in more detail. But let's go back in the past. I have some historical arguments. In France, in 1790, we had about 250,000 different measurement units. 250,000 different units. Each city had a different one. I have here some uh, values for uh, the weight. Marseille had 399, was one pound. Uh, Montpellier, 394 grams. Toulon, 465 grams. Toulouse, another gap. Each city had a different mass unit. And, and uh, in Europe, we had many, many units related to grains. Because the grains, they look so identical. And the mass unit grain was very familiar. But for example, the English grain was 64 milligram, one French grain, 53, German grain, 65. So each country has different units. How can you make international trade if you have so many different units? And therefore, already at the French Revolution, there was the idea by the uh, working group of the Academy of Science to have a universal set of units. And they uh, introduced. First of all, the metric system by the French Academy of Science that we use 1, 10, 100, 1,000, and not 12 and 60, and these numbers which were useful in other uh, cultures. And there was even the idea to have one day, 10 hours, one hour, 100 minutes. But this was the only one which was not very successful, because there was the idea to have one week, also 10 days. <laughs> and you know the French. They demonstrate if they have to work longer. Uh, and there was really a protest on the streets in Paris. So the clockmaker, they made already clocks with the two different systems. But this was the only one which was not successful. And so therefore, we have today still not the decimal, the metric system. But for the other one, we have now the kilogram, the gram, the meter, the kilometer. Uh, kilometer and you know that uh, we had the standards for the meter uh, and the kilogram, and the idea was the length from the pole to the equator, 10,000 kilometer, and one liter of water, one uh, kilogram. This was a basic idea, which should be the global units. But to realize this is so difficult that we had the prototypes, this kilogram, and this uh, length bar as a meter. These were artifacts as global standards. But it took another 75 years that we had an international agreement. And this was one of the first really big international conferences. You see here the excellence of the President of the United States of America, Majesty of Emperor of Germany, Majesty Emperor of Austria and Hungary, Majesty King of Belgium, and so on, Majesty Emperor of Brazil. They came together in Paris desiring the international uniformity and precision in standards of weights and measure. And they agreed really to have these standards. It was a big event in 1875. And, uh, all delegates should get a copy of the meter and the kilogram. And you see here, even the president of France uh, participated in the production of the kilograms and the meters, because each country should have as a gift this standard so that everyone in the world knows exactly what the meter and kilogram is. And here in Singapore, you have, for example, the copy number 83. This was the kilogram. In Germany, you had the copy number 52. This is the kilogram. But the official kilogram was the Grand Kilogram, which was kept in Paris, in uh, Versailles, uh, in the safe. This is the official kilogram. And from time to time, they compared the national kilograms against the official one. And there was an increasing deviation with time. And today, we know that the melting process of the big K was different from the copies. And therefore, uh, the diffusion of gas out of the kilogram was different for the different materials. So they are not stable enough. So you see, you can really measure differences between the different kilograms, the official one and all the copies in the different countries. And therefore, already in the newspaper, you can see a crisis. The grand kilo loses mass, or a kilogram pro uh, prototype mysteriously loses weight. And therefore, OK, one should be unhappy about the situation that something is a standard which is not stable. So therefore, already in 20, nearly 20 years ago, 
there were a publication in 2005, redefinition of the kilogram, a decision whose time has come. And fortunately, at this time, were the first experiments to have a new way to define the kilogram. And one way is towards an electronic kilogram, electronic kilogram, and which is simultaneously also an improved measurement of the Planck constant and the electron mass. And I will just give, show you a sketch of these electronic kilogram. Let's see, where is it? The electronic kilogram based on the electrical quantum standard. And one is the so-called Kibble balance. So this is a sketch of such a balance. The balance is in equilibrium if you have the same force on this side and the same force on this side. And here you have the force, the mechanical force, just by the kilogram. And on this side, you have an electrical force. Electrical force, more or less electromotor. When electrical current is flowing in the magnetic field, you have a force. And this force balances the force on this side. And now I mentioned to you, we have with the quantum Hall effect and with the Joseph effect, quantum phenomena for the volt and the resistance, and therefore also for the uh, current, and we can calibrate all these electrical units in these quantum units. And if you analyze these experiments, the final relation is that we have a one to one relation between the Planck constant and the mass. So originally, the kilogram in Paris was used to make high precision measurements of the Planck constant. But now you can say, okay, I go in the opposite direction. I fix the Planck constant and then. I have a realization of the mass. So this was a basic idea. And there was a lot of discussion, and I was involved in this. Now, if you have problems to find this relation between the mass and something in quantum mechanics, the Planck constant, then most of you know at least the Einstein relation EMC squared. And Planck, in optics, he introduced a photon that the light is a package of energy, H, Planck constant times the frequency of the wave, electromagnetic wave. And if you combine these two equations, you see immediately there must be some connection between the mass and the Planck constant, because velocity of light and the frequency, I will tell you later, they are very well known. So there is some possibilities to relate the mass to the Planck constant. And today there are two high precision measurements which are able to look at these relations and this is the watt balance, which is called now the Kibble balance I showed you before. But there is another method, also the so-called X-ray crystal density method, where in principle you count atoms and you build up from atoms a kilogram. So these two ways give you this one-to-one -one relation between the Planck constant and the mass. And in 2005, we had an important meeting at the Royal Society in London. This was the starting point of this revolution. Uh, as you see here, my original device where I discovered the quantum Hall effect, the silicon MOSFET. And then we had the discussion about the new international system of units. And the title of this conference was The Fundamental Constant of Physics, Precision Measurements, and the Base Units of the International System of Units. And at this time, the first results of this new definition of the kilogram, this is so-called Watt balance or Kibble balance, was presented. And this was a situation in 2005. So here we have these seven base units, which should be very reliable. But we knew that the kilogram was an unstable kilogram. The atomic clock replaced already the rotation of the Earth as a time constant. So since 1968, already the atomic clock was the basis for all measurements of the time. And in 1983, when one tried to measure the velocity of light, one discovered that the meter was not accurate enough to measure accurately the velocity of light. So this was a limitation, the meter definition. And then in 83 already, one has fixed the value of the velocity of light. And in this way, one has a new realization of the meter. And the meter is, a defi uh, is defined by taking the fixed va value of the speed of light. This is a fixed value. If, and if it's expressed in meter per second, then automatically you have a new definition of the meter by fixing the velocity of light. And this is a blueprint for our new international system of units. So we are not changing the names of our base units. We have still the meter. But in principle, we have fixed the fundamental constant. And now we have these 
fantastic electrical quantum unit, the stable electrical unit, the volt, which is related to 2e over h, the resistance, which is related to h over e squared. How can we integrate this? And then we have to give up something, and we have to give up the kilogram and the ampere. And today, we relate the kilogram to a fixed value of the Planck constant, and we relate the ampere to a fixed number for the electron charge, because the flow of electrons is an electrical current. And today, you can, in principle, buy such a prototype, industrial prototype, and they call this a Planck, Planck balance. This is really a, a balance where the electrical force is compensated by the mechanical force, and the Planck constant is the basis for all these measurements. And this is a vision of Max Planck. He had already the idea, uh, more than 120 years ago, to have units related to fundamental constants. And I will, since I'm director at the Max Planck Institute, I make some public relation for Max Planck. He got the Nobel Prize in 2018 for as a father of quantum theory. When he explains the radiation, the black body radiation, he had to introduce two constants in this equation. And this is the birth of quantum theory, the emission of a, a black body radiation that changes to the temperature. And he introduced the Planck constant and the Boltzmann constant. And his first paper in 1900, which is the start of quantum theory, he has a, a, a chapter about uh, natural units. And Max Planck was more interested in fundamental constants and natural units than in quantum theory. If you read this paper, I have here a translation of one of the sentences he wrote, with the help of fundamental constants, we have the possibility of establishing units of length, time, mass, and temperature, which necessarily retain their significance for all cultures, even unearthly and non-human ones. So even the aliens, they should know something about fundamental constants. And these natural units based on fundamental constants, this was the idea of Max Planck. And he introduced already in his papers these Planck units. He discovered the Planck constant and the Boltzmann constant, but the gravitational constant, the velocity of light, were already known. And by combining these constants, he introduced the Planck length, the Planck mass, the Planck time, Planck temperature, just by combining these fundamental constants. But unfortunately, they are not very useful for our daily life, because with 10 to minus 33 centimeters, you cannot buy anything. And the time with 10 to minus 43 seconds, or a temperature 10 to 32 Kelvin, this is not our daily life. And fortunately, the quantum Hall effect triggered the introduction of a measurement system based on constant of nature, because by introducing also the elementary charge as a fundamental constant, then you have this resistance. And fortunately, this resistance of 25 kilogram is just in the center of our measurement system of resistances between an insulator and a good conductor. You can do very accurate measurements in this regime of 20 kilo ohms or 10 kilo ohms. This is the best regime to do high precision measurements. So this has some really practical applications. And indeed, this fundamental constant, fixed values of these constants today are the basis of the modified international system of units introduced on the 20th of May, 2019. And I will show you now this new definition. Now all the students have to wake up, because this is the only educational slide I have. I will show you again what is our new system, because you should not teach to young scientists the wrong picture. So if somebody introduces a kilogram, it's not anymore this piece of metal in Paris. It is a fixed value, and this value will never change in the future. This is a fixed value for the Planck constant. This defines the unit of mass. And if you think about the temperature, the temperature we learned normally the melting point of ice or the triple point. This is a fixed point, and this determines our temperature scale. No, this is not correct anymore. You should forget this definition. The Boltzmann constant. This is the fixed value for the Boltzmann constant. There are many, many different experiments which can relate the Boltzmann constant to some temperature. So, and the same happens for the ampere. Originally, the ampere, the electrical current, if you have two wires 
and the current is flowing is y, you have a force. And this was originally the definition of an ampere. Now, this is not true anymore. We have fixed value for the metal charge. And also the mole. The mole is not a certain number of atoms to have 12 grams of carbon. This was the old definition. Today, the Avogadro constant is just a fixed number. This is just amount of substance. This number is a fixed number and not related anymore to carbon. <laughs> and you can have here this new SI system. And here you see these fixed values, which will never change in the future. The Planck constant, the elementary charge. And if they are fixed, then automatically you have already the Josen constant and also von Glitzing constant, which are fixed numbers today. So the conclusion, natural constants are the most stable basis for a universal system of units for all time, for all people. And this is the official logo. We have still the old names, but inside we have just the fundamental constants, which have fixed numbers. So in 2018 was the conference, and then 2019 it was introduced, quantum metrology united all countries at this meeting. And at the end of my talk, I will just mention that in 2018, another quantum started, and they started a science and technology war between nations related to quantum computer. And just I will tell you a little bit about this uh, new hype starting in 2018. In Europe, we have this famous quantum flagship billion euro program, which started in 2018. In the United States, the National Quantum Initiative Act, uh, and uh, its uh, main idea was to provide a coordinated federal program to accelerate quantum research development for the economic and national security of the United States. And one and a half years ago, Biden signed a national security memorandum, uh, uh, leadership of the United States in quantum computing by mitigating risk to vulnerable cryptographic systems. So in a certain way, some Manhattan project in uh, quantum science uh, started uh, worldwide in, uh, around 2018. And quantum becomes political. If you look at this picture, this is an IBM quantum computer. Uh, and uh, if you look at the money which spent this year, it's estimated 38 billion goes to global quantum efforts. And about half of the money is invested in China. And there are many, many other countries which have billion uh, dollar programs uh, all over the world. In Asia and in, in Korea, you have such a program. So, and also here in Singapore, you started very early also to invest in quantum science. And the reason for this fear of quantum computer for security is uh, an algorithm which was developed in 1994 by Peter Shaw. And he demonstrated this, that with a quantum computer, you should be able to uh, factorize a big number in prime numbers uh, much easier than with a supercomputer. And uh, this was the driving force from the security point of view to start uh, uh, everywhere in the world this quantum computation. And perhaps this paper also uh, initiated uh, this fear that breaking the 2048 RSA security code with the quantum computer with only 372 uh, qubits. Uh, I don't know whether it's correct. It's not accepted because here uh, Google uh, uh, scientists published a paper how to factorize the 2048-bit RSA integers in eight hours, and they used 20 million of qubits because the qubits are not ideal, and we have always to ask whether we speak about physical or logical qubits. And it's not really clear how many qubits are necessary for a useful quantum computer. You can do a lot of things, uh, quantum simulation. There's a lot of interesting things, perhaps the folding of proteins, new materials. There's a lot of questions which can be perhaps uh, solved by a quantum computer. But it should not be the fear of the security to drive this field. And just last month, we had at the Vatican a meeting quantum science and technology increasing or decreasing the technology and social gap between nations. And uh, the final statement of this meeting was cooperation rather than competition. We have reached a point where we understand how to mitigate quantum comp uh, computing attendant security risk. We must now channel it towards society, uh, socially 
positive application instead of nationalistic competition uh, of first achievers, deep partnership and proactive collaboration will enable us to effectively harness the full power of this profound new technology. And uh, CERN in Geneva is jumping on this idea and they will create an open quantum institute and you see here next uh, March, 1st of March, they will announce this quantum technology initiative. So a three-year program will make quantum computing resources and technical expertise available to projects designed to support the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So this is all in preparation. In 2025, we expect an international year of quantum science and technology with the logo 100 years of quantum is just the beginning. And this is a roadmap. Now in next month, there will be the formal proclamation that we will have in 2025 uh, this world year of quantum science technology in January 25. There will be this launch at the UNESCO headquarters in Paris. So the future is quantum. There is a lot of new applications. I call quantum 0.0, .0 Max Planck because he didn't recognize really the importance of quantum physics. Einstein Bohr, quantum 1.0. Quantum metrology is just a small part of this, and the quantum 2.0 is mainly today connected with the name quantum computer, but quantum simulation will be the first step. And there's a lot of other quantum phenomena, quantum sensing uh, will be very important part. So thank you for attention, and I have this card for you if you ask interesting questions. Uh, so you will get to, or you can pick up this card with all the information about the numbers you should remember and about the value of the von Glitzin constant. Thank you. Professor Kahn? Okay. Come have a seat, please. Yes. Okay. So let me just uh, no, thank uh, Klaus for a really engaging and wonderful talk, which uh, talked about metrology and the foundations of it. And so li leaving us with some words of inspiration for the future. Um, let's open the floor quickly for some questions. Uh, perhaps we can start on the right. Thank you so much for the exciting lecture. I am Miao from Tokyo Institute of Technology because I noticed that I, I'm, I was really amazed by your discovery about the quantum hall effect. I was wondering back to 1980, that time, how, uh, what kind of strategy you used to get this really simple but very beautifully uh, equation? Thank you. No, this was an accident. This was <laughs> As an experimentalist, you're doing research, and I was interested to understand uh, microelectronic devices. How can I improve a silicon field effect transistor, which is the most important microelectronic device, and uh, to understand the motion of electrons, how uh, small we can make the structures, how fast they can move, to understand the microscopic picture of the electron motion in a field effect transistor. And a field effect transistor is already the so-called two-dimensional system where only at the surface of silicon the electrons are moving. And I was interested in basic science to understand the microscopic picture of uh, the motion of electrons. And the classical Hall effect is normally used to get some information about the concentration of charges which are moving in this. So, and I have done experiments and saw some small wiggles so I showed you really show curves today, but at this time it was just a classical Hall effect with small deviations. And I saw suddenly on my recorder at the same position uh, some noise where I saw half year before this with the other sample from the other uh, supplier, the same noise. So I said, okay, I should understand. This is, is this a dirty effect or is it an interesting effect? And then Immediately, I had some experience in high precision measurements. And uh, in half an hour, I saw this is very fundamental value. And the next day, I called already the Metrology Institute in Germany and asked them whether I uh, interested in a resistance standard based on fundamental constant. So this was a click. I was not looking for this. I was a free scientist. And therefore, I always recommend to the students, if you see something as an experimentalist, which is unexpected, and it's not on your roadmap, but take the time and look at the side way to have this freedom. Therefore, I'm fighting always also for basic science and the freedom that
that you can go in other direction because if you do basic science, you have very often hard walls, you cannot to pass, but you can go in other directions. So, uh, and I was always successful if I go away from my original idea by just looking at the nature to understand nature and uh, to find out whether it's a dirty effect or a good effect. To 99%, if you see something unexpected, it's a dirty effect. And you need some experience to find out what is fundamental and what is basic. So this was really, I was not looking for something like this because in the dirty semiconductors, you cannot expect such a fundamental phenomenon. And uh, this is fantastic to have these macroscopic phenomena. And when I told this and the theoretician, this was really an experimental result. Uh, and this uh, evening, you will hear something about topology. When I uh, spoke uh, to theoreticians, they said, there must be something behind which has something with integer numbers. Otherwise, we cannot have these step-like changes and step-like behavior. So uh, this was really luck. And if you speak to Nobel Prize winners, very often they say unexpected results were the starting point of the, the breakthrough and the, the, the discovery. Okay, thank you so much for your suggestion. Uh, thank you, Professor, for a very nice and interesting talk. My name is Monish Khan. I'm a PhD student at Chalmers University of Technology. My, my question is regarding the fractional co quantum Hall effect. I know there is still some ambiguity in understanding that what exactly explains it. What's your view on it? And do you think the precise explanation of fractional quantum Hall effect is something, uh, would offer something exciting regarding the understanding of classical Hall effect or the SI unit. Thank you. Okay, it's not my field uh, because the other Nobel Prize. But I, as an experimentalist, I like the so-called composite fermion, that you combine electron with flux quanta, with two flux quanta, and they have also fermionic statistics. And if, if this new quasi-particle, you can transform the, or explain the fractional quantum Hall effect as an integer quantum Hall effect of this new particle, this composite fermion, where you combine two flux quanta plus one electron. This is for me as an experimentalist because they, you can predict many, many things in, in, in this way. So the easiest way really to have introduced this new quasi-particle because the so-called fundamental integer quantum Hall effect is one electron plus one flux quantum, but then you can combine this with uh, other numbers, and then you have fermionic and bosonic statistics. And I recommend, as an experimentalist, always to use this composite fermion picture to understand the fractional quantum Hall effect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, Professor. Thank you for your insightful talk. Uh, I have a question about um, one of the fundamental assumptions. You said that the constants are constant, but actually, I think in quantum field theory, at different energy scales, the fine structure constant actually deviates depending on the energy scale. So do you think there should also be um, a different set of units defined from these new drifted values for different energy scales when you're looking at these fundamental systems? OK, this is a very fundamental question. Are fundamental constants constant? So this is always the low energy uh, fine structure constant which is interested here. But nobody was able today to see a time dependence variation of the fine structure constant. We have a boundary that per year, with 10 to minus 18, you are stable with the fine structure constant. But there are many theories which predict or which assume that also this constant should change with time, maybe with the expansion of the universe or some other parameter. But you will get the Nobel Prize, I guarantee you, if you can convince me that fundamental constants are changing with time. Uh, and a lot of groups today are really looking for transitions with very accurate uh, frequency comps uh, where the fine structure constant in spectra is important and to look whether with time there are some differences. You, as I mentioned, with 10 to minus 18 per year, these are constant. There were some publications that are from quasars, from far distance uh, radiation. There was some change in the past of the fine structure constant. But the scientific community is not convinced that somebody has seen some time variation fundamental constant. And in metrology, we are working with the real world. And uh, normally, at eight digits, that is good enough for us. So the fundamental constant in our world are constant enough 
for, uh, to have a time-independent basis of units. But this is a very fundamental, very important question. Time depends on fundamental constants. Uh -huh. um, can I follow up? So what about at energy scales past like the Landau pole? Um, I think the coupling constant in QED is supposed to uh, diverge to infinity, right? Yeah. Or, oh. Okay, so we, we go always to low energies. There was some publication that even the quantum Hall effect, if you go to very high so-called cyclotron energy, that this energy is m electron c square is comparable, then there should be quantum electrodynamic uh, correction. But then we have to go really to extrapolate to zero energy, uh, to zero. And also in experiment, we always extrapolate to zero temperature. We do measurements at two different temperatures, and they show the same results then we know that the extrapolation with zero temperature is also okay. But in principle, we have to go to low energy phenomena. Thank you. All right. Do we have any more questions from the floor? I have still one card, yes. <laughs> Comment about uh, uh, one of your last slides about a Chinese claim last year that a quantum computer with 372 uh, uh, qubits will be enough to break RSA. This paper had been thoroughly uh, uh, shown to be in inaccurate and uh, it's based on a wrong algorithm. So RSA is still alive. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, you know, in the interest of time, because we have the morning break coming up, perhaps we can thank uh, Professor Klaus again for a wonderful talk this morning. <laughs>